There are two stories concerning Hegel's encounter with Napoleon at Jena. The first is apocryphal, but romantic and sublime. Hegel was supposedly penning his final touches on the phenomenology of spirit when the guns of the battle roared behind him and, in a chaotic moment of genius, edited a few sections based on Napoleon's invasion. The second is verifiably true. Hegel wrote a letter to his friend and former colleague, Friedrich Niethammer, and he wrote, I saw the emperor, this world soul, riding out of the city on reconnaissance. It is indeed a wonderful sensation to see such an individual who concentrated here at a single point, astride a horse, reaches out over the world and masters it. Who was Hegel and why did he have this seemingly lofty view of Napoleon? Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was born August 27, 1770 in Stuttgart, then part of the ancient duchy of Württemberg. His father was a low-level bureaucrat to the duke and his mother, the daughter of a prominent lawyer and legal scholar who was in the service of the duchy. He attended the theological school at Tübingen, where he was roommates with the famed German poet and other philosopher Friedrich Hölderlin and Friedrich Schelling. An early enthusiast of the French Revolution, like many young middle-class Europeans on the continent as well as in England, the excess of the terror turned him sharply in opposition to the extreme form of revolutionary Jacobinism that swept the country, but he remained an admirer of the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The first story concerning Hegel and Napoleon is admittedly my favorite, if for no other reason than it provides a frantic imagination and context to an always overlooked section of the phenomenology. Near the end of his long-winded explanation of the emergence of culture from the world spirit, Hegel concludes his thoughts by reflecting on absolute freedom and terror. Like Edmund Burke, Hegel considered the French Revolution and its consequences, quote, the greatest world event of our time. The sublime activity of the spirit in trying to make the rational actual leads to terror, hellfire, rather than any heaven. However, because of the movement of history, this hell is properly a purgatorial state before final sublation of the old into the new. The road to heaven, after all, runs through the fires of purgatory. As Hegel says, absolute freedom has pure self-identity of the universal will, thus has within it negation, thus has within it the reality of destruction. Pure freedom, Hegel asserts, along with the identity that comes from it, which is universal to the human spirit, has within it the properties of destruction and only emerges because of destruction. And the emergence of the negation is a prerequisite for universal freedom. From this conflict, Hegel writes, there has arisen the new shape of spirit, that of the moral spirit, which engages and motivates all action. Thus, Hegel transitions out of culture and into his famous section of morality. The purpose of the world spirit is to negate, destroy, the uncultured naturalistic simplicity and individuality, Einzelheit, which accompanies that primordial state of existence and builds it to a higher, newer reality of integration. The negative terror which purges the world and individuals into a new state of being, a new state of living, the moral community, as Hegel later goes on to define and describe it in detail in both the phenomenology and elements of the philosophy of right, therefore is the transitory and transitionary state which requires the hero, 
the world hero, to usher in the new epoch. This now requires us to know something of Hegel's anthropology in order to better understand why a hero emerges to unleash the terror, the horror, and the destruction, which inevitably leads to a greater, newer reality. Hegel's philosophical anthropology, most thoroughly defined in his lectures on the philosophy of history, but already visible in the phenomenology through his scattered reflections on the citizen and the hero, as well as other individuals, is indispensable to understanding Hegel. To summarize, Hegel's four archetypes of humanity are the hero, the citizen, the person, and the victim. The hero is the chosen instrument of the spirit of history, the individual who is the utilized engine to usher in the new age and to found states and civilizations. The hero, in modern parlance, is the founder or the father of the nation. The citizen is the embodiment of sitlikkeit, the ethical order, the rooted participatory individual attached to the manifold responsibilities and duties of life, family, fatherland, and community. The citizen is rooted in an identity, past, present, and future, a state and a civil township which ground his existence. The person is the exemplar of the inferior moralitat, poorly understood and translated often as morality in English traditions, wherein the person lives a good but ultimately detached and deracinated moral life for himself to make himself feel better in the world. Many of our social justice activists today, Hegel would probably assert, are exemplars of persons living the inferior moral life as opposed to the rooted ethical participatory life of the citizen. The final archetype, the victim, is even further beneath the person because not only does he live for himself, much like the person does, but the victim is totally unconcerned with the good life in the abstract sense, which at least the person does care about. The victim seeks a mere materially comfortable existence for himself, apart from all relations to the world. The victim, for Hegel, is what Friedrich Nietzsche would later and more famously describe as the last man. Only the hero, with regard to Napoleon, matters to us in understanding Hegel's sublime reflections on Napoleon on the eve of the Battle of Jena. The hero is the most exalted individual in the Oriental Age of Despotism because the hero transcends the limitations of primordial life to found the new state, nation, or community in its movement to a settled, communitarian, national existence. He and his descendants often become the god-kings common to Near East political theology. In the modern reality, however, heroes still emerge to inaugurate the movement into the new order by canceling out or destroying Aufhebung, the old and the old order. Before 1789, the epochal existence of Europe was at the sunset of the aristocratic age. The aristocratic age, as Hegel more fully developed in his lectures on the philosophy of history, is characterized by freedom for some and servitude for others, most. This state of existence was also dominated by feudal agrarian systems and laws. Greece and Rome were the most exemplary forms of this state of existence, and the Holy Roman Empire in Hegel's time was the residual, deracinated, and inferior form of the aristocratic age, inherited by Greece and Rome through the fall of the Roman Empire. The French Revolution at the, birth of Medor of the, at the birth of modernity signaled the beginning of the end of this state of existence. The Oriental Age of Despotism had moved in the, into the aristocratic age 
of limited freedom. But now we are moving into a new state of existence through the progress and the unfolding of history by the dialectic. The French Revolution and the birth of modernity signaled the end of the old order, and this is what Hegel was principally concerned about and trying to understand. The reactionary powers that confronted France in 1792, particularly the decadent Habsburg monarchy, which ruled over the feudal principalities of the Holy Roman Empire, along with Prussia and Russia, were the lifeless corpses which the movement of history had left behind. By 1806, when Prussia foolishly went to war with Napoleon, having dithered away its possible advantage of joining the War of the Third Coalition in 1805, Prussia and the Rhine principalities of the Holy Roman Empire were the dying and decadent feudal aristocratic entities that needed to be negated, purged, and destroyed by the world spirit, the hero on horseback, to move these backwater and backward entities into the new revolutionary world. Eustace Moser may have thought that such an Aufhebung would mean the end of a thousand years of tradition and legal codes, but Hegel knew that such a negation was necessary for universal freedom under the law to manifest itself. It was, therefore, necessary for these states, of which Jena was situated, to experience the purgatorial cleansing, the terror, before arriving in a new paradise, the so-called end of history. But who was the hero to bring about this cataclysm and deliverance? It was not a German, but a Frenchman, the world soul astride a horse, as Hegel described Napoleon. This conflict between Napoleonic France, where the individual will of Napoleon was already removed to allow the manifestation of the universal world, was inescapable from Hegel's perspective. And in this conflict between old and new, absolute freedom will remove the antithesis between the universal and the individual will, as Hegel writes. In other words, the defeat of the feudal and reactionary forces of Prussia was predestined to happen. The individual will and naturalistic simplicity of the Rhine principalities had to be destroyed in order for progress to begin and the march into the new Eden heralded by the angels of the French Revolution to commence. The hero, however, is something of a tragic figure in Hegelian thought. Hegel, we must remember, was steeped in the Greek classics and a great admirer of Greek poetry and tragedy, which undeniably influenced his outlook on life. He was, after all, also roommates with Holderlin while theology student at Tübingen. The hero was not free in the way that citizens or persons are free, and this is why, even though the hero is exalted, the superior life is the life of the citizen. The hero is the chosen handmaiden of history. From time to time, history reaches out and lifts up great men, heroes, to do her bidding. This was the case with Napoleon, according to Hegel's perspective. He was the instrumentalized hero of historical progress. Thus, the world soul astride a horse, as he wrote to Niethammer. As such, the hero is the universal instantiation of the world spirit in history. The hero transcends parochial boundaries and genealogy while, paradoxically, advancing deeply parochial and particular constructions everywhere they go. Take Napoleon, for example. He was a Corsican who became the founder of the modern French state. As he and his armies rolled into Western Germany, he would become the founder of the Confederation of the Rhine and, by spiritual outgrowth and destruction of reactionary Prussia in 1806, upon his famous entry into Berlin, he also is responsible for the construction of modern Prussia and, by that extension, the modern German state. 
Thus, it is appropriate to see Napoleon not merely as a French hero, but a universal hero who helped bring into existence modern Europe. The logic that Hegel establishes for us helps us to understand the adoration of such revolutionary world soul heroes throughout history, men like Lenin, Trotsky, Mao, Castro, etc. Unlike the heroes of yesteryear, who were distinct to their own people, King Arthur to the Britons, Clovis I to the Frenchmen, or George Washington to the Americans, the heroes after the world soul advance the universal spirit of emancipation, purgation, and new creation. This, of course, is a universal, not particular, construction. Again, this is how, from Hegel's lenses, he could see Napoleon as not only the founder of the modern French state, but as the indirect founder of modern Prussia, Germany, and the rest of Europe. But the celebration of, latter, of the latter-day hero is a celebration of fire, destruction, and purgation, the eradication of the present order for the creation of the new. As Stalin said, in order to make an omelet, one must first crack eggs. The latter-day hero is the breaker of eggs because he is the maker of the omelet. Afterwards, he leaves the plate for the rest of us to eat, and we give him thanks for his work. But the truly enlightened, so to speak, know better. It was always inevitable. Hegel's celebratory statements about Napoleon reflect a restless mind and soul who looked to the carnal and ephemeral to find meaning and destiny, imbuing it with a secularized Christian language of the spirit for spiritual justification. Hegel's heroic Napoleon was God in history, bringing about the eradication of original sin, so to, so to speak, the old order, and transform, and transform the earth back into a new Eden. Hegel's heroic longing becomes the spiritual yearning he abandoned in formal Lutheranism for a new, heretical, and fantastically spiritual absolute eros with a destructive and cathartic impulse in the world. God does not break into history through miracles as the scriptures inform us. God is found in history through epochal transformation and movement to something new, grander, and more exhilarating through the formation of relationships and the birth of higher consciousness. And nothing was more heroic and exhilarating than seeing the purgatorial fire mounted on horseback before unleashing the guns of cleansing on the dead carcass of Prussia, needing to be wiped away so that she could become something new and better. Hero worship is not a new phenomenon when it came to the writings of Hegel. It did, however, take on a new spiritual heart for God and a secularized reality. For God was no longer to be found in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, but in the heroes of history who bring about the new world through grand changes of fire and bloodshed. Hegel's heroism and world soul have contributed to our own political messianism and apocalypticism because we no longer look to the true God-man, but in the spark of divinity found in men and women, driving history to its supposed teleological conclusion, a belief ironically inherited from that great German revolutionary and theologian named Martin Luther.